Okay, uh, it's nine o'clock here, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to to this webinar. And uh, we are very happy to to have here with us Dr. Ian McGowan. Uh, he uh, presented on uh, at Croy, and uh, I mean his presentation was very well received, was uh, considered very useful, and we uh, thought he might be able to pre uh, make it actually a, a slightly longer presentation because we have more time than at Roy uh, uh, with us here this morning, and, uh, and he was very kind to, to accept, so he uh, he's with us this morning. This is uh, one of our webinars at the a network for multidisciplinary studies in HIV-based HIV prevention, and uh, his talk is going to focus on the promise and challenge of sustained delivery pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, Ian McGowan uh, is a professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He qualified in medicine at the University of Liverpool in the UK and has additional doctoral degrees from the University of Oxford and the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, Ian is the PI of the University of Pittsburgh based microbicide trials network, uh, an HIV clinical trials network established in 2006 by the NIH, NAID. Uh, and uh, he's a PI of, of uh, MTN. As, uh, or as a PI of the MTN, uh, Microbicide Trials Network, Ian has oversight of a major, of a major global effort uh, to design and implement an expansive portfolio of Phase One through Phase Three uh, clinical trials at more than 30 uh, clinical research sites in eight countries between 2006 and 2020. Um, so, um, I think his contribution has is. Uh, 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 permanently made uh, visible through uh, uh, presentations and publications. So I think it's very interesting for us to have uh, Ian here. Um, as you know, I mean, these webinars we 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 have a live session. Uh, it's recorded and uh, we uh, very quickly publish it, and it becomes available to anybody who who want to to. Um, uh, see it at uh, either at our website or in our YouTube channel as well. Um, people know that uh, I mean a couple of, uh, of announcements. First, that we have started a Spanish uh, language series of uh, uh, presentations as well. So normally it's uh, the first part of the month, and uh, yeah, we're going to have one in two weeks. You will get the announcement soon. Uh, this session, I mean, that's Spanish and Portuguese, and, and uh, concerning this session, people are welcome to uh, make uh, comments and questions. For that purpose, people can use the chat window uh, on the um, lower uh, part of the uh, right-hand side screen, little screen of uh, GoToMeeting. So, um, people are welcome to participate in, in that way. We uh, Normally we, we close uh, mics to avoid interference. So I think uh, that's what I need to do. Uh, uh, again, this is a presentation on the promise and challenges of sustained delivery prep. So I think uh, Ian is going to sort of, uh, provide an overview considering the, the ongoing use of oral prep and the possibilities of uh, of new uh, ways of using PrEP, no, that are still under uh, research, that are part of research trials. So again, thanks uh, Ian for being here, and thanks to all for your participation. Please, Ian, welcome. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be able to tell you a little bit about what I've called the promise but also the challenges of sustained delivery prep. So we think about the promises first of all. Um, I think we all know that whether we're talking about treatment for HIV infection 
or we're talking about using antiretrovirals for oral pre-exposure prophylaxis, one of the big challenges is adherence. Put very simply, if people don't take the product, the medicine, they won't benefit from it. And this is a problem in medicine very widely. Um, uh, and so in conditions such as providing women with protection, schizophrenia, um, uh, drug development groups have these developed products which have characteristics of long-acting potential. So in contraception, we can give women Depo-Provera, which can provide contraceptive efficacy for many, many months. Um, and similarly in schizophrenia, we can provide formulated drugs as long-acting depo injections. Um, and so this is a, is a well-trodden sort of pathway. And so perhaps not surprisingly, um, uh, manufacturers are now moving towards the development of long-acting antiretroviral products for both PrEP and treatment indications. Um, a study uh, done a couple of years ago explored um, the willingness and the interest of potential users of pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, what they felt about the idea of using a long-acting injection. And you can see this data from Mayers et al, published in 2014. Um, and they looked at, first of all, the willingness to use quarterly long-acting PrEP. And I think you can see that the, the majority of people were either definitely or probably interested in that strategy. Uh, and when they were asked about, you know, your, their personal preference for route of administration, interestingly, you can see that the, the vast majority of people really were interested in an injection. Um, and so um, I think we have good preliminary data here uh, that there could be a market, there could be an uptake for this kind of strategy. Um, this is a, a, a different population. Uh, this is data actually from women at risk of HIV in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and this was some data put together by Ellen Lewick and her colleagues and presented at Vancouver, uh, and was from the VOICE study, which is a study where we randomized almost 5,000 women to receive either topical gel um, or oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and they were asked in, during the course of interviews um, about what hypothetical choices uh, they would make in terms of product preference. And once again, you see some very similar data. Um, they were asked about tablets and films or vaginal gels, um, but the majority um, were quite interested in either an injection or an implantable or ring type device. So really a device which could be used at one point in time and would provide protection for an extended period. Um, so now we have data really from young gay men um, in the Mayer study and we have data from young at-risk women in sub-Saharan Africa. So moving on then, where are we uh, with regards to injectable PrEP? What can we actually provide folks? Uh, well, what are the, some of the requirements for a long-acting product? Um, I think the first and most important is clearly infrequent dosing. I think having a product that you can give once a week really doesn't solve the problem, um, but a product you could give uh, every two or three months might, might do the job. There is an issue about injection volume. Um, my talk's really in two parts. The first part is really about long-acting injections. And at the end, I will tell you about some of the strategies to develop implantable devices. But if you're going to talk about injections, then you really want to limit the volume. You don't want to give large volume injections, uh, particularly of products which might cause local injection uh, discomfort. So really, four mils is about as much as you can do. We really need a stable formulation and a formulation which we can uh, ideally uh, do without cold chain requirements. Because once you have a product that has to be stored, refrigerated, you have issues about distribution, um, uh, and that becomes a, a challenge for rollout of the product. So what's in the marketplace at the moment? Really, there are two main products currently being evaluated. We have the NNRTI real piverine or TMC278, uh, and we have the integrase inhibitor cabotegravir or GSK744. There are, as some of you may know, um, a, a range of monoclonal antibodies which are either going to be given as an injection or more likely an infusion, um, which may also provide potential for protection. 
I'm not really going to discuss those today because I think that they're at a very early stage of development um, and uh, there are a number of issues which, which really would warrant a talk um, uh, uh, devoted to that topic, particularly with you may be familiar with the AMP study where people around the world are receiving IV infusions for HIV prevention. So why do these products work? Well, basically, the chemists have done some um, clever formulation work um, where they've uh, taken these drug products, they've milled them into a very, they ground them really like pepper, if you will, into a very um, fine uh, suspension, um, which increases the surface area and drug per solution rate, um, and really allows us to load quite a lot of drug into a relatively small volume um, of fluid. Um, and in, in terms of uh, the long-acting PrEP agents we're using, really the majority of the formulation is drug. So the first drug I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail is Rilpivirine, because that's one I've worked with mostly myself. Um, this is a drug which is licensed, uh, known as Edgerant in the US certainly, for the treatment of chronic HIV infection. And you can see straight away uh, the daily dose is 25 milligrams. This is, this is quite a potent drug. Um, if you think about tenofovir, that's more like 300 milligrams. So it, it's potent. Um, uh, the EC90, uh, the effectiveness concentration, again, is quite low. So those are two key characteristics. Any drug you want to formulate as a long-acting drug really has to be um, very potent. If you have a drug which is not that potent, you're going to end up with a large volume product, which will, just won't work as a, as a long-acting injectable. Um, we know from treatment studies of HIV prevention, probably the target trough level, the lowest level we would want to see is about 70 nanograms per mil. It's a little bit controversial, but that's, that's one possible um, uh, level. Uh, and really, the, the target uh, product profile was that we would give 1,200 milligrams of this product every eight weeks. Um, and as it's formulated 300 milligrams per mil, you see straight away that's a four mil injection which we've generally given as a split dose, two mils um, times two. So really the first important study of this product, there are some preliminary studies, but the, the real first important one was conducted by Akil Jackson and his colleagues in London. Um, this was uh, essentially a dose escalation phase one study in HIV negative volunteers. Um, they received a single IM dose. Uh, the dose range was 300 through to 1200 milligrams. Um, there was a smaller subset of men who only received the 600 milligram dose, as you see here. And really, they wanted to look at the uh, primary uh, objective being characterization in detail of plasma, genital tract, and rectal pharmacokinetics, or, or what, what level of drug concentrated in these compartments after a single dose. And this is a picture really showing you um, the plasma levels of real piverine uh, associated in, with this study with an injection of uh, bilpivirine. Uh, it's color-coded, um, so the highest dose is in blue, 1,200, um, in yellow, 600, and in green, 300. The dotted red line is really just showing you the protein-adjusted EC90, or if you will, the level we're trying to stay above. Uh, the y-axis is the concentration um, of the drug in, in the plasma, and the x-axis is the time in days, and that's really the first clue that this is very different. You may be familiar looking at PK plots of oral drugs, um, and you don't see this kind of exposure extending out, not just days or weeks, but years. And certainly at the 1200, uh, 1200 level um, of administration, you're seeing you're well above this uh, EC90 dose. In this study also, they collaborated with Betsy Harold in New York. Um, and what they did was they collected secretions um, and they looked to see whether or not there was enough drug in the secretions uh, to inhibit HIV infection of a cell line. Uh, this is what we sometimes call the TZMBL assay. So basically you take cells which are vulnerable to HIV, you expose them to the body fluid of interest, uh, and then you add virus. And what you're seeing here is really what you want to see, um, that the higher the dose of real piverine in the fluid, uh, on the x-axis, then the greater degree of HIV inhibition. So we're seeing what we call a positive PKPD relationship. Again, that's an important endpoint, if you will, in, in trials. 
if the line was horizontal, there would be no relationship between the amount of drug and viral inhibition. So that wouldn't be a great PrEP agent. Now, the study we did, which um, uh, we, we presented and we're just busy writing up, was called the MWRI, or McGee Women's Research Institute 01 study. This is a study we did here in Pittsburgh. Uh, and essentially, we brought in a population of healthy men and women. At the end of the day, I think we had 24 women and 12 men. Um, they had a screening visit um, to exclude any um, STIs or any other health problems that would uh, make them unsuitable. Um, they came in for a baseline visit where we collected fluid and tissue and everything. Um, and then we gave them drug. We either gave them 1,200 milligrams, which was two shots, uh, two mils, one in each buttock, or 600 milligram, which could be given as one shot. Um, the tissue uh, and um, uh, fluids we collected at baseline, we evaluated for their infectability in the lab. So we basically took these cervical, vaginal, and rectal biopsies before the patient received any drug. We took them back to my lab. We exposed the tissue to virus. We incubated for a couple of hours. Uh, we washed all the virus away. And then we put the, the samples into the uh, in incubator uh, and let them sort of simmer for two weeks, um, at the end of which you know, we collected uh, supernatant to see if there was any inhibition of virus infection. A unique feature of our study, we think, was these, these amazing participants were prepared to come back every month for six months to have biopsies collected from cervix, vagina, and rectum to see that after this single dose, how long did the antiviral effect persist um, uh, in not just um, you know, in fluids, but actually in the tissue at the sites where we anticipate infection could occur. Um, so here we have um, some data, and it looks a little bit like um, uh, the data from the previous study, which was conducted in London. Um, essentially, what you have is on the left, you have the 1,200 milligram dose. On the right, you have 600 milligram dose. Again, we have the dotted line showing you the EC90 we want to be above, um, of about 12.5. Um, and basically, you have the, the, the mean value um, over time with the 90% confidence intervals. And so you see initially after the injection, there's a peak of about 80. And then over time, this, this diminishes down to about the level of the threshold that we want to be at. But again, look at the x-axis. And what you're seeing here is that these, these levels are above the threshold we want, really out for multiple months. Um, perhaps even three or four months, and I'll come back in a minute. What you also see if you just look at plasma and you compare the 1200 to 600, there's clearly a dose effect, and you're getting much more exposure, as you'd expect, with the 1200 milligrams. Um, what you see below is the levels of drug in different body fluids, in cervical vaginal fluid and rectal fluid. You have the same dose effect, but if we just concentrate on the 1200 milligram dose, I think what you see here is that the lowest level um, was actually in the rectal fluid, and the highest level was probably in the vaginal fluid. The curious thing we found in our study was, though, if you looked at the tissue levels of drug, and we go to the bottom panel here, what you see in blue is the levels of drug in rectal tissue. And you see at every time point, really, apart from maybe the last time point, um, there is more drug, um, perhaps twofold more drug in rectal tissue compared to vaginal tissue. And that's, that's going to be important when we get to uh, looking at effectiveness of the product. So here's some data. Um, this is the same explant challenge uh, experiment I told you about. So basically what we're looking at here is the tissue that we took from the individuals before and after drug exposure. Um, basically, um, a baseline, which is visit two, and then a month, two, three, four months later, we took them, we challenged them with virus, we let the virus grow out and see how much inhibition of viral infection we got. So in this particular graph, in red, we have the results from the 1200 milligram arm compared to the results from 600 milligram. Uh, and what you see at baseline, there's high levels of infection of the tissue. That's what you expect to see. There's no drug about. But look at uh, the visit six, whether it's 600 milligrams or it's 1200 milligrams, profound inhibition of viral replication. 
So one month after an injection, um, you're, you're actually seeing really, really robust inhibition. And certainly for the 1200 milligram arm, this really persists out to uh, four months. And the 600 milligram, you can see the virus replication rate begins to increase. So once again, there's a dose effect. Now, if we look here at these data, this is going to be a bit of a complicated slide. It's the same idea, though, as you've seen before. We're plotting the amount of virus the tissue produces against the amount of drug. Um, and whether we look at drug in tissue, the rectal tissue, that's the top box, or we look at the amount of drug in plasma, or the amount in fluid, what you're seeing is this negative correlation. So as the drug concentration increases, the amount of virus decreases. So once again, this is a positive PK-PD relationship, whether you measure drug in tissue, plasma, or fluid. But let's see what happens now in cervical and vaginal tissue. And the thing you notice, first of all, in cervical tissue, rather than this line sort of starting in the left and going down to the bottom, it's horizontal. So what this means that the irrespective of the concentration of drug in tissue, plasma, or fluid, there is no change in the amount of virus being produced by the tissue. What you can see is that most of the red dots are on the right of the panel, um, which just tells you that's the 1200 milligram dose. So there was dose variation, but there was no effect on virus. And in the vaginal tissue, although it was non-significant, there's almost a trend suggesting that as the concentration of drug increases, you get more virus production. So it's actually going in completely the wrong direction. So that's something we'll come back to, but to summarize, Following a single injection of pivirine, you get very good inhibition of viral infection in rectal tissue, but no impact on viral replication in cervical or vaginal tissue. So, what's, uh, what's to do with pivirine? Well, we finished the entire study now, actually. After the single dose study, we then went on to do a multiple dose phase with 1200 milligrams every two months, and we're just analyzing those data at the moment. Um, the MTN, uh, sorry, not the MTN, the HIV Prevention Trials Network has completed enrollment into a phase two evaluation of rilpivirine. Um, but I think it's fair to say at this point in time, rilpivirine is unlikely to move to a phase three study. A um, couple of things. One is it does require cold chain storage, which is not a positive thing for rollout. Another thing which I didn't mention, but in, this, in the London study, one individual who received the lowest dose of drug, who was by, well, she, she was exposed to HIV infection um, by her partner from South Africa. She actually became infected um, and did develop resistance to rilpivirine. So that's not good. Um, but it is still being, uh, it's a good drug in many ways, and the long-acting injection formulation is still being developed as a treatment, uh, treatment option. Um, uh, as a combined approach with long-acting um, uh, uh, integrase inhibitor, uh, cabotegravir. So that brings me on to the next of the two, the two products being developed. So I've told you about rilpivirine, which is an NNRTI. Now we have cabotegravir, which is an integrase. Again, it's a potent drug. Uh, the IC90 is also very low, and the PrEP dosage is, is still in evolution, but might be 800 milligrams. Um, every eight to 12 weeks, more likely eight weeks. Um, and this is formulated at 200 milligrams per mil. So if you have an 800 milligram dose, you're looking at, you know, uh, four mil injection. So why is everyone excited about cabotegravir? I think they're very excited partly because of this graph. Um, so what you're looking at in this um, graph is a non-human non primate study. So this is where you take um, non-human primates, macaques, um, you give them the injection um, of the drug of interest or placebo, uh, and in this model, you do repetitive challenges with virus, and you see, is there any difference in the rates of infection in the animals over time? And I think what you can see here, this is a classical Kaplan-Meier plot on the left. Um, you're seeing on the x-axis the challenges, um, on the y-axis, the percentage of um, animals who do not have infection, and you see this amazing difference. So the animals receiving the cabotegravir were completely protected, not just after one challenge of virus, 
but multiple challenges. Um, whereas those receiving placebo, as you would expect, became infected over time. Um, on the right, we just have the, um, just showing you that indeed they were being infected. This is the kinetics of infection in the animals. There's no doubt they were using the appropriate virus. This is a uh, human data from Bill Spreen. Uh, this again is showing you the kinetic or the pharmacokinetic profile of capitagravir. Again, it looks very similar in a way to the uh, real piverine plot. You having an injection at time zero, you get a big bump um, of viral um, of, of drug concentration, um, particularly in a dose, dose proportional fashion, and then over time it decreases. But the time we're talking about here is, um, is weeks or indeed in months. Um, and again, we have the, um, the margins, the thresholds that the cabotegravir team are interested in. We have the protein-adjusted IC90 and the fine dots in black. In the larger, larger dashes, we have four times the um, protein-adjusted IC90. And in terms of their target profile, they really wanted to keep the plasma level above four times the protein-adjusted IC90. So you can see that according to this study, at least, um, you were looking at 24 weeks was the time, or perhaps 20 weeks when it dipped below this threshold, getting pretty close to it at 16 weeks. Um, so this has implications for dosing frequency, obviously. One of the things that's a little bit unusual when we start looking at the compartmental PK um, of cabotegravir is that obviously you can measure the drug in plasma very easily. But if you start looking at the relationship between plasma and tissue, Unlike perhaps the vulpivirine data, there's very little drug in the tissue. Um, in cervix and vagina, there's about 16 to 19% of the plasma levels in tissue, so a fifth of plasma levels. So there's no real accumulation, and you can see that in these plots. Perhaps even more dramatic when you look at the rectal tissue on the right in males, um, and what you're seeing there is in red just about is the level of drug in tissue compared to the level in plasma um, at different time points. Uh, and you're seeing very little, which raises the question, of course, well, how is it working if there's no drug in tissue? And I'm not sure that's really been answered. Uh, I think the animal data is very compelling. Um, but obviously, until we do an effectiveness trial of this drug, we won't know if it works in, in, in humans. Um, the company, for their own reasons, don't want to use the explant challenge assay. Um, so, you know, we're left wondering, um, is the protection due to perhaps drug levels in lymphoid tissue, in mesenteric or regional lymph nodes, or is there some other mechanism? So, you know, I think we can say at this point, incredibly um, compelling uh, data from the animal studies, whether in fact you give a rectal challenge, a vaginal challenge, or an intravenous challenge, um, but the PK is a little unusual. And, and partly to answer that question, there are some additional studies ongoing to further explore PK. So as I said, I've shown you some preclinical data, the non-human primate study, very encouraging. Um, lots of phase one safety studies completed. Um, HBTN once again has their phase two study um, enrolling, uh, and the Eclair data are recently presented. I think the big study for cabotegravir is going to be the HPTN 083 um, study, which um, will be a phase three effectiveness trial um, uh, conducted globally. So that's quite a lot about long-acting injectable drugs. Um, what I'm going to tell you much more briefly now is an alternative approach. This is an approach where we actually implant a device, um, which over time will gradually release drug um, and achieve the same you know, goals of having long-lasting protection. So the first product um, is uh, this little device you see here. Um, it's a tubing implant. Um, it's basically, it's a silicon rod, um, which you can see on the right there. You can see how big it is. Um, essentially, it's very simple. There's a bunch of holes punched in the um, implant, and the solid core matrix has a drug of interest. In this case, this is tenofovir alafenamide, or TAF. Um, and uh, colleagues um, uh, listed here published some very exciting data in collaboration with Craig Hendricks at Johns Hopkins describing the PK profile. Um, and this is a graph, again, just showing you over time um, the concentration. Um, and 
what you're seeing here, I've just highlighted, is the level of tenofovir diphosphate um, in the plasma over time. And this is this study I should have mentioned was not a human study. This is a study where they implanted this device into dogs, into beagles, in fact. Um, and when they did some dose proportional calculations uh, and sort of said, well, if in humans we had the same kind of relief characteristics over time, they thought they might have a product here which could actually release drug perhaps six to 12 months over a period of six to 12 months. And I think this is even more so than injectable drugs. It's very important that an implantable device can actually deliver drug over long periods of time. Because obviously it's not entirely simple to put this kind of implant in and you don't want to have to take it out or change it too often. Another approach which I've been involved with working with Arian van der Straten in San Francisco and her team with USAID funding was to say, well, could we have another kind of formulation where we put the product in, but it actually degraded spontaneously over time. So it released drug, but you didn't have to remove it. And so this is the prototype that we've come up with. It, again, um, we're looking at tenofovir. Um, it's a, a polycaprolactone biodegradable implant. It looks a little bit like a sachet of sugar that you might get in a restaurant. Um, but the polycaprolactone, which is the envelope, if you will, is the key, the key component of this design. Um, this is a very simplified cartoon. But basically, you know, it's like, like a tea bag. You have the thin film polymer membrane on the outside. You have your solid drug core. The biological fluid surrounding the product after insertion obviously comes into the solid core. It dissolves a certain amount of drug. And then depending on the physical characteristics of the polymer membrane, the drug will leach out over time. And no matter how quickly and how much can actually be tuned. Um, so this is trying to illustrate that point here. Once again, you see the products on the right. Um, but the two key variables we can change are the membrane area, if you will, how big the implant is. But you can also tune the membrane thickness. And these two little graphs here are showing you that obviously if you have a bigger um, surface area, you get more drug release. Um, and if you have a thicker um, polymer, um, then the cumulative release over time is reduced. Um, so it's, a, it's often really due to the altering the geometry, size, and membrane thickness, you can really tune how much drug is actually delivered. Um, this product has actually been used in um, sutures during surgery, contraceptive implants, root canal fillings. So it's FDA approved, and so that's, that, that's a big help. And on the right is a cartoon really just showing you um, the dissolution process. So over a period of time, which is probably weeks or even months, um, the drug is delivered, but you can actually design the product so that once all the drug is delivered, the actual polymer breaks down um, and is biodegradable and you don't have to remove. One of the important characteristics of an implant is that Although you want it, it's, 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 it's an advantage to be biodegradable. You, need, you want to be able to remove the thing if you have to, if the individual, the, the person taking the implant has an adverse event. So both the tubing, obviously that's removable, um, but this product, for the first couple of months, you could in theory remove it if you wanted to. It's only longer term that it actually dissolves. So in terms of safety, this is a product which can be removed, at least initially, but ultimately will dissolve away. How do you get the thing in? And I think this is one of the issues that we're all working on at the moment, because <clears throat> at least from my perspective, this is a slightly scary collection of uh, sort of torture instruments, instruments. But actually, these are the, the kinds of products we use to give women contraceptive implants. Um, and so the particular um, engineering specifications that will be needed for these implants will pro probably be product specific. But I think what's going to happen is people will get an injection like this and the implant will be put in. They may need a little bit of local anesthetic in the skin to, to make it a, a painless procedure. But you can imagine again, you wouldn't want to be doing this every three months. 
you might only want to do this if this happened every year or perhaps longer. Okay, so that's all the good news. You know, clearly we're making progress in identifying drugs that can be formulated for long-acting delivery. Um, we have both injections and we're beginning to have implants. So is it all good news? Well, I think it is good news, um, but there's some things we need to be a little bit cautious about. I mentioned this before, but safety. When you give someone an injection, which is going to hang around potentially for six months or longer, there's a problem if the individual has an allergic or an adverse event related to the drug. You can't get it out. With an implant, maybe you can, but you can't with an injection. Um, acceptability, I think injections, I can honestly say in our studies, they've been very well um, accepted. It's not been a major issue, but I think implants will be a new, a new area. Adherence um, is clearly um, an issue uh, in the sense of these strategies mean that you can prevent problems of non-adherence in theory, but people will still have to come back for repeat injections. PK issues and resistance. So I'm just going to mention a couple of these in a little bit more detail, as well as operational complexity. So um, this is a, a nice picture of a lizard, um, a, a Komodo dragon. And the question was, well, why, why, why did I show this? Well, it's because um, lizards have very long tails. And this is a concept, the PK tail, um, which is uh, something we're kind of interested in. This is a graph you've seen before. It happens to be from one individual, not a whole population. It was a woman receiving 1,200 milligrams of ropivirine. But this is the area I've just highlighted we're a little concerned about. Because in this area, which is probably the four-month to seven-month window, the drug concentration is diminished significantly. It may well be present at a sub-therapeutic level. And it's in this window that if someone got infected, they would probably get resistance to that class of drug. And so the question is, you know, although there is promise here, there is also potentially a problem. So if people had an injection, decided they didn't like it, went off back into the community, were at high risk of HIV, at some point within this sort of red box, they could be exposed, they could become resistant. And resistance does happen. We know from many, many studies, resistance is associated with low drug concentration. And as I mentioned very briefly before, one of the individuals in the London study of Rilpiparine who did receive a low dose of drug whose level of drug had diminished even further, um, uh, when she became infected, she developed resistance. Um, and so I do worry a little bit about during large-scale implementation, we have to really counsel individuals that, you know, if you don't come back for repeat injections, you will potentially be at risk of uh, infection and resistance um, if you have low levels of residual drug. This is just a cartoon um, from the individual who did seroconvert in the St. Thomas's uh, study. Um, you know, this is the red line I just lit up is the level of drug you want to have to prevent infection. Uh, the blue line is the amount of drug she had. And unfortunately, you can see that at the time, the very time she was exposed, and if this is going to work, um, the drug level was very low. She was infected by someone who I think had recent infection, and then she developed a classical um, seroconversion illness. Um, she was started on treatment, but we were able to see um, this, this band here when we did sequencing that during this period of low drug, rising viral load, she developed a mutation, uh, the K101E mutation to HIV. So she was treated successfully with a non-NNRTI regimen, but this is, this is what can happen. What do I mean when I say operational complexity? Um, what I really mean is that um, because of safety concerns, many of the studies are giving individuals a one-month oral run-in phase. They then get the injections every two to three months. And then, because of concerns about this PK tail, when they've finished their period on study, the stopping prep, uh, and then they're given 12 months of oral prep. So if we believe the general strategy of long-acting prevention is it's for people who don't want to take oral prep, if we have this kind of complexity where you have to begin with oral prep and end with oral prep, I think there is an issue there. 
Now, is the one month oral run-in really necessary? I think we're beginning to decide it probably isn't, so we may be able to get rid of this. But what happens in this period after individuals actually um, stop the injections really needs to be worked out. So really to summarize all of this information, I think the two lead candidates, 744 and 278, have gone through phase one and phase two studies. I would argue they're very safe generally and acceptable. Most people do complain of ISR or injection site reaction, which lasts for a couple of days um, and then goes away. My sense from the data I've seen is that ISRs may be more common and a little more severe with cavitegravir than lorpivirine, but we need more work there really. Um, efficacy signals have been seen for both products. Um, with cavitegravir, the non-human primate model provides those data. For 278, it's explant challenge. Uh, and as I said, phase two studies are either completed or ongoing. Um, and the HPTN083 study of cavitegravir will be the, the pivotal study. So I'm going to end here by um, acknowledging all the people I work with, uh, Janssen, who provided all Piverine, uh, Bill Spreen and Alex Reinhardt at Beeve, who gave me access to information. Uh, my own study was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. As I said, the um, thin film polymer device was funded through USAID. And I'd like to acknowledge David Back and Laura Elson Liverpool, who I do a, a lot of the PK work uh, they, they helped me with. Uh, and my colleagues uh, in Pittsburgh who actually studies. So I'm there, and I would be very happy to try and answer any questions if you have any. Okay, Ian, thank you very much. A very comprehensive uh, presentation about these new options. Uh, I would uh, encourage uh, people to use the chat window for questions or comments. Uh, but in the uh, for the time being, I think uh, given your leadership in uh, research on rectal microbicides, uh, I would ask you if you could provide a, a very brief summary of uh, how you see the, the status of uh, uh, HIV prevention through rectal microbicides. Uh, Ian, is it possible? Can you do it? Yeah. Okay, so um, change of gear, rectal microbicides. Um, I think um, oral prep is fantastic, and we need to roll it out as much as we can and wherever we can. But I think there'll always be people who don't want to take oral prep. I, I think they're a poorly defined population, but I think that they exist, and, and maybe not insignificant numbers. Uh, and so many of us in the field, and I think uh, Jerry Galea is on this call, he's done a lot of work in this area, um, have been trying to develop a rectal microbicide, a safe and effective microbicide. So um, some of you will know, uh, we've done a lot of phase one studies, initial safety studies. Um, we recently uh, presented data uh, at CROI from the MTN 017 study, which is uh, with, uh, really comparing rectal and oral um, PrEP. Um, it was safety um, and acceptability, but also included some PK and um, uh, um, explant challenge work. That really showed, I think, that all, all modalities um, rectal or oral were very acceptable. Um, I think in our study, in being transparent, the people who were on the study, I think, had a slight preference for oral rather than rectal. They certainly had a preference for rectal given just before sex, not on a daily basis. So those data are, are still being analyzed and, and written up. Um, but I think it positions us now to ask some fundamental questions, which is, can we provide a topical rectal product just to be used before sex? And if we are going to do that, what's the best formulation? Is it a gel? Um, is it an enema? Um, is it something else? So where we are at the moment, we're about to you know, get involved with, I think, um, about four phase one studies within the MTN, all quite interesting. Um, the first one is the MTN 026 study, which is looking at a new product, the Piverine gel the same agent we used in the intravaginal ring, so that's a new, a new drug. Um, we're also doing a really interesting study where we're going to compare using gel with an applicator, where you put the gel in, or actually using it as a sexual lubricant. So basically giving guys a sex toy, a dildo, giving them the product, and then telling them to sort of, you know, basically have fun and try and use the product. And then we're going to compare and look at the safety acceptability 
but the also critically how much drug you can give to the rectal tissue when you use it as a gel rather than with an applicator. So that's an important study. Another study we're going to do is Conrad have a fast dissolving tablet. So we're going to do a phase one study of that. So you would just pop a tablet in, a rectal tablet, um, what they call it an insert, uh, that would fast dissolve and could be an interesting and a combination product. And then we have the DREAM protocol, which is looking at an enema, which is um, a phase one study is probably going to start in the next couple of months. You know, could people give an enema with a, uh, an antiretroviral drug and would that work? Um, we have a completely new class of drug called Griffison, uh, which is uh, a hugely potent drug and also active against multiple things. It's active against HIV, hepatitis C, um, hepatitis B, um, herpes, uh, and so uh, an exciting drug. Um, and that's being, that's being developed. Uh, and finally, I think we're just working on a protocol with the Population Council to do a, a dose escalation using escalating amounts of gel of a new combination product. So that's a very quick summary, but I think what it tells you is there's a lot of activity in early stage development and a lot of positioning going on to make sure if we do move into phase three, we have the best product, the one which people will really want to use, be able to use, and have the best chance of actually working. Yeah, no, that's actually very interesting because uh, what you were saying about the possibility of using a uh, uh, rectal microbicide that can be used more or less in the way that uh, oral prep was used in in Ypres, in, in in France, no? Probably something before and, and after sex, because probably it's more difficult to to to, to use uh, erectile microbicide every day uh, as compared to. Uh, I mean, an oral uh, uh, oral prep every day. If, if you have to use every day uh, a drug or a product every day, as compared to rectal, no. But probably, uh, if, if something could be found that is uh, that can be used probably twice before and twice after, uh, that would be probably much more convenient for users. Now, uh, have you thought of that? Yeah, I think uh, I think people have you know based on the studies we've done, because the 017 study, people actually either took rectal gel um, for eight weeks on a daily basis, which is pretty amazing, or they took it just before and after sex, a bit like the bat bat regimen in the Caprice studies. Um, and it was just very clear they would rather take it at the time of sex. There's no doubt about that. So I think what we're now trying to do is, could we develop a formulation, whether it's a gel or an enema or whatever else, that actually you just took before you went out uh, and it actually gave you protection for, let's say, three, four days. Because I think, you know, we're not entirely sure, and you know more about this than me, but from an acceptability perspective, you know, once people have had sex, do they really want to then put another gel product in? I think it would be much better if we had a, a product whose characteristics were such that you just took it once before. Yeah. And it may adjust to the pattern of uh, lubricant use among many people know that they may, if they are going to have, I mean, uh, sex for a sort of prolonged time, they may use, well, a significant amount of, of lubricant there. So I guess uh, it's also looking at the ways people already use lubricant and, and uh, uh, the, the rectal microbicide might match that pattern of use probably. No, but uh, anyway, uh, I was just, uh, um, Going to to ask you, what do you think about uh, the, the the current, uh, I mean, available and uh, potentially available in in in, in some time uh, uh, options of of prep uh, by gender? Because it seems like many prep options are uh, different by by gender, and uh, it seems to to remain because often rectal tissue behaves different. Uh, differently from uh, cervical, vaginal, also, and uh, and patterns of use, uh, even adherence may be different. So, uh, and and that could perhaps uh, uh, that you could comment perhaps in in the context of of a, of a timeline. What image of, of of a timeline do you have for for products? And now we have uh, uh, daily oral prep. Uh, the status of uh, Hypergay, 
uh, it's not completely clear to me because in, I think in France it's accepted. I don't know to what extent it's officially uh, uh, sort of uh, available everywhere uh, and uh, as, as uh, an acceptable way of using prep and and then uh, uh, some forms of uh, microbicides or the ring. Uh, um, related products in South Africa. So I guess those are steps forward, but the results haven't been uh, sort of, uh, extremely uh, good. So uh, what's your, your view of uh, uh, gender uh, uh, or products available by gender over time? There are some great questions that um, could take a long time answering them, but let's try and be brief. I guess um, <clears throat> I, I, I actually believe very strongly that if women use oral prep, it will work. Um, I think there may be some different um, pharmacology or pharmacokinetics in women compared to men. Um, I think it may be true that um, oral prep is less forgiving in women. So whereas men, I think, if they take three or four tablets a week, they're probably protected. Women, they may need to take tablets every day. So it's not that I don't think the potential for effectiveness is there. But I think when we look at the studies that have been done in women of oral prep, the data have not been great. And this is where I sometimes get into trouble with people because I think there's a lot of prep advocates who don't want to hear that. But you know, we I've certainly been involved in studies where we've given oral prep to women and no one used it, you know, and that's why it didn't work. Um, and so I, I do think there are challenges in persuading particularly young women to you actually to use any kind of HIV prevention strategy, um, but I think oral prep is particularly challenging. Maybe so. You know, I think you mentioned the Ring study. Um, two studies, both showing the products were safe and effective. But you're absolutely right. The level of effectiveness was a little disappointing. It was about 27, 30 percent, something like that, and that was primarily driven by the younger women who didn't use the product or didn't appear to use the product based on PK. So. You know, many, I probably began with this, my first slide, you know, unless a product's used, it will never work. And trying to understand issues around desire, acceptability, and what people will use is going to be critical to, to any strategy. Um, and I think the, the, the group we always come back to are the very young women. And so MTN has been working with this population. We have just completed, or, you know, just about completed a study looking at the vaginal ring in adolescent girls in the U.S. 15 to 17, um, seeing if they'll use product or not or what influences them. We're also preparing a similar study to be conducted in African young, younger adolescent women. So a lot of work to be done. Um, I think it's fair to say that for women, they have more challenges with PrEP potentially because I do think there is some truth in the, math, in the fact that the, that the way the drugs distribute often those higher concentrations in rectal tissue compared to cervix or vagina. Um, and so, you know, women almost have to be more adherent to get the same type of benefit that men get. But it's an interesting area and very challenging. Yeah, I was just thinking, uh, women uh, tend to be much better with contraception because it's something very much associated with uh, being women. And uh, I mean, they. Uh, however, uh, prep seems to me that it's associated with planning for sex. And uh, not just uh, in terms of contraception; it's planning for sex, maybe for pleasure. So, I guess uh, there there are gender issues there. No, and men are men are more allowed to to think of uh, probably on uh, planning for for sex, and they do plan for sex. Women probably have a harder time, a more difficult time thinking. I mean, planning for that. No, so I guess that's a huge issue in terms of. Uh, uh, Adhere, potential adherence and uh, no, it, it's an ideology, gender related ideology. Anyway, uh, I think there's one, uh, there's a question here about uh, PK no? uh, and uh, the, the PK tail, uh, which is problematic. So, how do you think it's going to be resolved, the issue of uh, the, the, the PK tail, no? the, the fact that there's a long period where, where I mean, it, it's too low, and I mean, essentially, the transition to to remind people that they are not protected any longer; they sh should switch to something else. Yeah. Well, in in practical terms, I can tell you that in the 
phase three study and uh, HPTN 083, which is the cabotegravir study, as, as I said, um, participants, as they finish their final doses of the injections, will be provided with access to 12 months of oral PrEP. Um, and in principle, if they took you know, the medication every day, then they would be protected. Um, and even though the level of cabotegravir was diminishing all the time, they would have a second line of defense. So that's how it's been done in a trial. Um, but you can imagine, you know, there's lots of things you can do in a trial that in terms of rollout is going to be very difficult. So yeah. I think, you know, we have experience from young women perhaps getting depo provera. You know, I'm sure it's all about counseling and understanding and saying, look, you know, we're going to give you this injection today. It will definitely protect you from pregnancy for three months. After three months, it's going to be much less effective. Um, you have to do something else then. And it, I think the same kind of messaging will have to be developed in this area um, that, you know, if you stop taking the injections, you may be protected for a period of time, but then you will not. And even worse, if you get infected in this time, it won't just be, you know, you'll get infected, but you may get infected and develop resistance. So, again, I think there's a lot of work to be done in that space. Mm. And what do you think uh, is the level of variability in pharmacokinetics, in PK, uh, for these drugs, no? Do you think uh, it's the variability is l uh, low enough, or maybe there are more issues in variability, given that uh, people are considering uh, intramuscular, subcutaneous? Uh, I mean, you have gender, you have uh, uh, sexual practices. So I, I think um, there may be several issues, and uh, to what extent do you think? We, we or issues have been identified already, or there are still many issues to be sort of uh, uh, pointed uh, out? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I think because people do vary so much in shape and size um, within populations and between different populations, um, you can imagine when you give someone the same volume of drug as an injectable, um, the consequences may be quite different. And I, you know, for those who were focusing, you know, the data from the, uh, the London study and our study, um, the PK profiles were really rather different. Um, the level of drug we saw in folks in Pittsburgh was significantly less than we saw in London. And we really don't know why that is. Um, but, you know, race, gender, body size, um, all sorts of things could play into that. So I think the important thing from the bigger studies that are happening, you know, they're going to take a lot of that collect a lot of that, that data so we can begin to know that yes there's variability but with this dose and it's usually the higher dose you do actually the, you know, the lower quartile of drug concentration is still well above where you want to be so I mean maybe that's that's how we manage it but I think there is going to be more variability and one last question because we're almost I mean our time is almost finished uh, this what do you think uh, this uh, these options might uh, have in terms of of the cost of, of prep of different forms of prep. Do you, th do you think it's going to contribute to sort of uh, diversifying, uh, or are these products going to be available? Uh, I mean, for a market in lower and middle income countries as well. What do you think? So uh, again, that's not a great question, um, and it's not something we really well, some of us do think about, but, you know, I think when you're in the middle of doing a trial, you're not necessarily thinking about that because there's always economies related to scale up. You know, if your product gets across the finishing line, then, you know, you can scale it up and it'll become much cheaper. Um, but still, I think we can probably say that uh, the vaginal rings, I think, at scale will be one of the cheapest technologies because I think the target there is maybe a ring which might be 4 to $6 every three months. So a whole year's supply might be less than twenty dollars. You know, then it might be oral prep. You know, generic oral prep from somewhere. Um, I think currently the injectables are going to be, you know, more than that. So I think they will be one of the more expensive options. But for people who can't or won't use anything else, it might be a worthwhile investment. So it's just yeah. like you know, it, the analogy is just like going to the family planning clinic. You know, there are different options for different people, and you have to try and match up the person with the product that works for them that they can use. Um, but I, I do think the long-acting injectables will be one of the more expensive options. And the implantables, depending on, you know, 
the technology, how long the in implantable lasts for, um, how it's actually put into the individual, those will all play into, into cost. Yeah, and, and the laboratory uh, decisions as well, because I think it's essentially a market issue as well. <laughs> we all know that. Yeah. Anyway, I think it's been a fantastic uh, presentation and, and uh, discussion. Thank you very much, Ian. I think, uh, I mean, this is very useful because it provides a perspective of where we are and uh, what uh, we might expect. And, uh, I mean, issues are important. So, uh, thanks again. We are uh, going to edit this and, I mean, essentially and, uh, up upload it in our website and uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, probably between today and tomorrow, and really thank you. And we hope we'll have you some time in in the in the near future for I mean, maybe to talk more about uh, microbicide study or something like that. So thank you very much again. You're very welcome, and thanks everyone for joining the call. Take care now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.